In this video, we're going to discuss vibrational motion. Now, this is the first lecture and a discussion on the quantum harmonic oscillator, which is a really foundational uh, quantum model within quantum mechanics. But before we start discussing any quantum mechanics, I think there are two really foundational pieces from, uh, from classical mechanics that we really have to discuss and have a good grounding in before we put the quantum mechanics on top of it. And the first is vibrational motion, and the second is reduced mass. So, uh, so first we're gonna discuss what is vibrational motion. So you may have seen this in your regular general physics class before, right? Two masses attached to a spring, right? You got mass one and you got mass two. And as you start to, you know, if you were to apply some uh, force to mass two that pulls it in the opposite direction, uh, this the spring would have a restorative force that would bring it back together, right? Just like a general spring. Now, why is this very important in chemistry? So I kind of want to give a good motivation here. Um, the harmonic oscillator model is extremely important in chemistry uh, because we, we, in general, chemists view chemical bonds as individual harmonic oscillators, right? Think of this, these two masses as two atoms, Right. And instead of being held together by a spring, they're held together by their um, attractive forces. Right. The electrons that they're sharing or their opposite charges. Right. Whatever's holding that that bond together. Right. That could be the restorative spring force. Right. So. Um, so this is a very important model when you think about chemical bonding, when you think about chemistry, it's very foundational. Right. Um, now, the restorative force is governed by something called Hooke's law. Right, which Hooke's law just establishes that hey, when this uh, when you pull on this thing, it's going to restore back to its equilibrium position, and we call that restorative uh, force um, the the spring spring force, which is de um, defined by the spring constant. Right, so there's a force that's going to be equal to what we'll call negative k f. This will be called the spring constant times x. So this is the spring force. the restorative spring force, and it is a, the fundamental force of vibrational motion. This is going to be our spring constant. And this is uh, the displacement of the uh, from the equilibrium position. So this is the displacement from equilibrium. Right, and we have to be very careful here when we talk about X, right? We're talking about, in this context, the displacement from the equilibrium position, right? So you have, um, you know, this spring that's at some position. If you were to pull on this mass, it would go to another position, but when you would bring it back together, it would come back to this equilibrium position. So that's what we mean here. Um, so another way that you can write this force that's a little bit more uh, explicit is to say L minus L naught, right? Where L is the current length of the spring and L naught is the equilibrium length of the spring, right? And so this is always just that distance from equilibrium. Okay, so this is your Hooke's Law force. We'll actually get some use out of this um, when we're talking about the potential for the harmonic oscillator. But for now, let's just think classically, right? So if we're thinking classically, thinking like a, a classical physicist using classical mechanics, um, we would want to put this, uh, we want to be able to describe this problem using Newton's uh, laws of motion, right? So Newton's equation. Right, so Newton's equation, you got some mass, right? You got mass times acceleration, right? So you got force plus, uh, is equal to mass times acceleration, right? Um, mass here is going to be tricky, and that's why I say we got to talk about reduced mass. That's going to be covered in the next video. But when we're talking about mass here, we're not just talking about mass one or mass two. We're talking about the mass of this of this whole thing, right? The masses plus the spring, right? This oscillator, this simple oscillator, we're talking about the mass of that whole thing. How do we define that, right? Um, now the acceleration would just be the change in position over time, the second derivative of position over time, right? That's gonna be your acceleration. And then the force here would just be kx, 
is equal to zero, right? Because this is your force, and then this is mass times acceleration. Right, and I'll go ahead and use KF here for our spring constant. So KFx. Okay, cool. So um, so we've built up the Newton's equation for a uh, simple harmonic oscillator, right? Now, this is a differential equation, and it, it has a general solution, right? So let's get out the general solution here. So the general solution to a differential equation of this type has the following form, where we have a constant times sine omega t. Now, omega is the uh, angular frequency. I'll write out its definition with respect to the spring constant in a minute. But um, then you have a second constant times cosine omega t. Right? So this omega, like I said, is the angular frequency. Let me write this off to the side. So the angular frequency, and it is related to the spring force, right? This is a omega, Greek letter. So this is gonna be related to the spring force. It has the following definition. So it's the spring force divided by the mass to the one half power, right? So the square root of the spring constant over the mass, right? That's gonna be our angular frequency. All right, so this is a general solution to a differential equation of this type. But now what we wanna do is to be able to tailor this general solution to our physical problem at hand. So there's two things that we're gonna to have to consider. The first thing is that at time zero, the oscillator is gonna be at some uh, non-equilibrium displacement A, right? So we can call this displacement A, right? And we, so we know at time zero, at t equals zero, the function should give you this displacement A at time zero. So what we can do is just plug in zero here in the position function. So we got sine zero there plus C2 cosine zero. And we can set this whole thing equal to the displacement A because we know that at time zero, it's going to have to equal that displacement A. So this sine zero is going to be zero. Cosine zero is going to be one. And so from that, you actually solve for the first coefficient here. C2 is going to be equal to A, right? So we solve for the first uh, coefficient here. C2 is going to be equal to A. A is just going to be the amplitude, right? The, the uh, non-equilibrium displacement here would be the amplitude of the oscillator. And, um, and more on that in a second. But uh, the second thing that we have to consider here is the velocity. So at t equals zero, the velocity should also equal zero, right? So, uh, cause it's initially going to be at rest. So we can actually solve for the velocity using this position function. So let me just start here. So velocity zero is just gonna be equal to the derivative of x with respect to time at t equals zero, right? So velocity is just gonna be the first derivative of the position. So all we have to do here is just take the derivative of each of these functions and uh, investigate what happens with the velocity here. So the first derivative of this term, uh, this sine omega t term is gonna be C1 omega cosine omega t. And the derivative here is gonna be negative sine. So you'll have negative C2 omega sine omega t, right? And then from there, all we have to do is just plug in times zero, right? So we have C1 omega cosine zero minus C2 omega sine zero. And so yet again here, right, we have cosine, um, cosine omega is gonna be equal to, or cosine zero there is gonna be one, sine zero is gonna be zero, so then we're left with zero is gonna be equal to C1 omega, right? Now, if we look at how omega is defined, right? Omega is defined as the force constant over the mass, right? 
this can never be zero, right? It would only be zero for something that was massless, right? Now, oscillator is not going to be a massless quantity. So this can't be zero. So in order for this to be true, that means that C1 must be equal to zero. So C1 is equal to zero. So we got both of our coefficients, C1 equals zero, C2 equals A. In fact, let me write this off closer here, right? C1 is equal to zero. C2 is equal to A. So that actually gives us our final function here. So we get X of T is going to be equal to A cosine omega T, right? So that's going to be your general solution for the classical uh, solution for the uh, simple harmonic oscillator. And so what does this look like graphically, right? So basically what this function is going to look like, let me write it again here so we have it as a reference, A cosine omega t right so if you think about the function being plotted right so you have x of t well let me give myself a bit more room here so x of t right as your x as your y-axis here right you would have the amplitude so you would have plus a and you would have minus a and then this x-axis here would just be time Right. If you were to plot this function, basically you would just get an oscillating cosine function that oscillates back and forth between positive A and negative A. Right. So something that looks like that. Right. You would get some oscillating function. So we'll come back to that when we start to talk about um, that's going to be important for us to understand when we start talking about what the wave function for a harmonic oscillator is going to look like. Okay, so the second thing, we've got the, the solution here for the, uh, for the Diffie Q, but what about the potential? So the potential energy, right? So the potential energy function here is going to be equal to, uh, so first let me uh, recall here that the force has a relationship with the potential energy where it is the negative first derivative of the potential energy with respect to position. And so from that starting point, right, um, we can actually solve for the potential by integrating the force. So by doing that, we have V of X is equal to negative integral of the force DX, right? And we actually have the force, right? This would be our Hooke's law force that we established in the first slide here, right? So if we plug that guy in, then we end up with negative, integrate that. You have negative KF times X DX. And so you can factor out KF since it's the spring constant, it's gonna be a constant that you can pull outside. X is gonna stick around in the integral. So you end up with X DX. And the solution to that is just going to be X squared or one half X squared. So you end up with one half KF X squared, right? So this would actually be your potential energy for the, har for, uh, the harmonic oscillator, right? So this gives you your potential energy function. So just as a quantum teaser, um, you can plug this uh, potential energy function directly into Schrodinger's equation to get your time independent Schrodinger equation, right? So you'll have H bar over two M, second derivative of the wave function with respect to X, right? Your kinetic energy operator. And then plus you'll have your potential energy. So you have one half KF X squared psi equals E psi. Right, so this is going to be different from the other scenarios that we've encountered thus far, right? Because we're actually going to have a potential that we're going to have to take into account. Um, now, the next video is going to cover what we mean by mass, right? Because uh, like I said previously, um, the mass here is not just going to be any one particular mass. It's the mass of the oscillator. And the way that we actually account for that mass is using something called the reduced mass. And so that's what we're going to look at in the next video.